Hello, ELA scholars. We're back um, from Thanksgiving break and moving on to chapter six of A Mighty Long Way by Carlotta Walls Lanier. Um, before we get started in the reading, let's go over the homework questions for chapter six. Remember, when you're reading, you're always going to want to jot down details. Um, for the things that are happening in each chapter so that you can come up with a gist statement or main idea or central idea of each chapter. Annotate for details to this question. In chapter six, Carlotta writes, in this battle, the segregationists forced everybody to choose sides. If you weren't with them all in the way of words and deeds, there was no middle ground. You were against them. She is describing the four groups of people she encountered at Central. How did the battle line set up the groups? While I'm reading, I'm going to be annotating for these four groups so that uh, we can have a better discussion in class. Let's head on over to our anchor text, chapter 6, pages 99 through 123. The Blessing of Walls. To my surprise, getting inside Central was just the beginning of a brand new struggle finding a way to survive. So much of my energy had been focused on gaining access to the school that it hadn't really occurred to me what daily life would be like on the inside. I wanted to believe that the cold stares, the name calling and taunts I had experienced on the first day would soon melt away. That the mobs would disappear for good now that the U.S. military's best stood guard. That the student troublemakers would turn their attention elsewhere that eventually Central would embrace me. It wouldn't take long for those hopes to fade. Ernie and Melva have said that for them, each day was a war. For me, it was more of an internal battle. How do I dodge the heel walker? How do I hold my books to avoid attack? How do I manage to get through the day without using my locker or going to the girl's bathroom? The strain of calculating my every move was consuming. There was no training for us in self-defense or in the ways of nonviolent protest or passive resistance. That came years later for the college student who sparked the city and movement at lunch counters throughout the South. Our training was on the job. And my earliest lessons came in the hallways between classes. The noise in the halls of Central was ear splitting the first month. Just imagine a constant stream of about 2,000 ruckus teenagers winding their way to classes in all different directions over five floors several times a day. Add to the mix nine much resented Black students and the atmosphere was volatile even with the presence of our military guards. The soldiers met us at home, at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Bates each day for a while and drove us to school. Then each of us was assigned a military escort to accompany us through the day. The troopers usually waited outside the classroom door until it was time to move to the next class. But I learned early that while the soldiers were there to make sure the nine of us stayed alive for anything short of that, I was pretty much on my own. They were in a precarious position for sure, but it seemed to me that too much just seemed to escape their ears and eyes, like the spitting, for instance. The band of boys in the black leather jackets were the worst offenders. They seemed to have come from the woods with their dank, moldy smell and their facial stubble, and they made a sport of spinning on me. If you've ever been hit, by a nasty gob, you know how disgusting it is, how humiliating, how infuriating. The first time, the wet slime just came flying out of nowhere, landing on the bottom left side of my face. My military escort usually walked on my right. I was trying to work my way through the crowded halls between classes on my second day inside when Without warning, I felt something wet hit my face. I flinched immediately. I knew what it was, but who had done it? It was useless trying to single out the villain in the sea of smirking faces quickly moving past me. Was it one of the black leather boys? Or did it come from one of their ponytail female cohorts? In either case, there was nothing I could do to respond. I had already been warned against retaliation by Dr. Blossom before school even started. Responding in kind 
could lead to my expulsion. And no matter how demeaned I felt, tears were out of the question. I couldn't let them see my hurt. I couldn't give them that kind of power. So without a word, I just wiped my face against the sleeve of my dress and kept on trekking. From then on, I stayed on guard, scanning eyes and mouths as I traveled the halls. I learned to jump back quickly or duck to avoid being hit in the face, but I always carried Kleenex just in case. Remembering the lessons learned in the halls became an important part of getting through each day. When the black leather boys of their female sidekicks walked close to me and knocked my books out of my hand, I learned never to bend over right away to pick them up, lest I provide the perfect target to get kicked in the backside and onto my face. Think about the groups. Carlotta is talking about the four groups that she names. Very important class. She's talking about this, um, what does she call them? Black leather boys. Okay. They seem to be harassing her quite a bit. She says, the first time it happened, I was completely blindsided. In a kind of one-two move, somebody slinked up to me on the left side and knocked against me hard, sending my books flying out of my hands. I guess I was pretty easy target because I usually carried an armload of books. I didn't like leaving anything in my locker because it was frequently the target of vandals, as were the lockers of the other eight. The vandals often left crude handwritten notes like, Ian word, go back to Africa. They sometimes took our books and destroyed our homework. So I usually piled into my arms so much, as much as I could carry. After my books went sailing across the floor, I leaned over to pick them up and somebody else whacked me with a foot in the bottom. I heard laughter in the background as I went down flat on my face. Stunned and embarrassed, I hopped quickly back onto my feet. Most times, my guard was was at a loss to stop an attack before it happened. The troublemakers were quick and sneaky, and they didn't seem at all threatened by the military presence. When I pointed out the assailants, the guard could only direct them to the office. One of my regrets is that I never got to know any of the men who journeyed through the halls with me. Unlike some of the other nine, I didn't have the same escort on a regular basis. I never even learned their names. To this day, I'm still unsure why my escort changed so regularly. The other nine declared I just wore the troopers out walking so fast. Melba got to know her guard pretty well and she thought the world and she thought the world of her Danny. He had no more power than the other troopers to intervene against the troublemakers, but he seemed to really look after Melba. He warned her when he sensed trouble ahead. He'd radio for help when the bullies approached her. He seemed to empathize with the scared teenager she was, and he taught her how to be a warrior. A couple of my other comrades got to know their guards too. It just wasn't that way with me. Maybe I came across as unfriendly or at times annoyed and angry. I wasn't angry at the troopers as individuals. They were probably decent, hardworking guys, and I never lost sight of the fact that they were the reason we had made it into the school in the first place. But the entire situation made me angry. I was angry that I had to face this kind of torture in a hollowed place of learning. Angry that the threat to my life was so great that I needed to be escorted to class by battle-trained soldiers. Yet those same soldiers didn't even have the authority to stop groups of hateful boys and girls from spitting on me and knocking me on my face. Well, I'd always heard that what doesn't kill you just makes you stronger. If I learned nothing else that year, I learned that. I did grow mentally tougher. I resolved that if the soldiers couldn't protect me, I'd have to do it myself. That's why I didn't have time to chat with them. That's why I raced through the halls most days just short of a sprint, heading to a class as if I were late for work. The soldiers had a job to do, and so did I. As I saw it, Part of my job was to avoid making the same mistake twice. That one tumble onto my face taught me to carry my books on the side closer to the wall and never next to the open hallway. And when I had to bend over, I learned to turn my backside to the wall as well. Thank goodness for walls. At times, they seemed the only protectors I had. The troublemakers found their protection in numbers. They always traveled in groups and with 
the many distractions and the high decibel unruliness in the halls, their antics could easily escape notice. When I walked past one group or another, impromptu champs would break out. Two, four, six, eight, we ain't gonna integrate. Then they erupt into laughter. Sometimes I'd feel a sharp kick in the calf or a jab in the arm as I passed them. I learned to just hold my peace and hope one of the more compassionate teachers caught a glimpse. There were indeed a few teachers who'd step in, call out a name, and write up a disciplinary report, but many of them just turned turned the other way. It was as though they stood in their classroom doors with their eyes and ears closed. They didn't want to know anything because to know might have required anyone of decent uh, conscience to do something. I didn't waste my breath reporting anything to them. I didn't want to face the frustration that some of my comrades faced when they tried to report violent incidents to, to teachers and were met with a question. Did any adult witness it? The guards didn't count. The teachers and the guards didn't stop the verbal taunts in the halls either, so I found my own ways of dealing with those, too. The insults were regular and plentiful, burrowed from every corner of the halls like rocks. Inward, baboon, you think you're white, coon? I tried to envision the words as bubbles left floating in the air or imagine in my head a name calling game colored folks used to call playing the dozens in which the one who could sling the most degrading insult ruled. When their words hit my ears, I kind of smirk to myself and think I've heard better from my own people. That's all you got. That much was true. I'd had plenty of practice with name calling all of my life for my own people, and we can be pretty creative in that arena. So I got good at letting the words just bounce off like balls. But I'd be lying if I said I, I managed to do so every time. Some days I just wasn't in the mood for any of it. Some days I was so mentally exhausted that I didn't have the energy to guard my heart. In those low moments when the troublemakers hurled their insults, they smashed my spirit like bricks. It took all of my energy just to stay on my feet and keep moving forward to the next class. Page 104. Class offered little solace, though. A whole new set of defense mechanisms were required there. Most common pranks usually involve my desk. A time or two, I plop down in a puddle of spit or glue, only to look up and find several of my classmates doubled over with laughter. Humiliated, I just did what I could to wipe the stain from my clothes. But from then on, I quickly inspected my seat with my eyes or ran my hand across it before sitting down. Some incidents I couldn't prevent, like flying spitballs, tiny bits of paper rolled with spit and blown out, usually through a short straw. They stung my face and my neck repeatedly, but it was more annoying than painful, and I refused to acknowledge it. At times, I'd hear the sudden flick of a fountain pen, and before I could lean out of the way, a spurt of ink would ruin my clothes. I just added a change of clothes to the stuff at the risk in my locker. After the repeated break-ins on my locker, I kept the change of clothes in the office of Mrs. Huckabee, the vice principal. The daily incidents of harassment kept me on guard everywhere I went in the school. When my class went to the auditorium for assemblies, my assigned seat was next to the teacher. The auditorium was, a, was quite a spectacle, grander than any I had ever seen before, except in New York. It was a bright, carving a space with theater style seating for 2000 students, professional lighting and a stage that was 60 feet deep and 160 feet wide. The stage doubled as the gymnasium and basketball court. With so many students together at once in the auditorium for assemblies, I was always on edge. I really saw other black students during those times. The only time I saw any of the other eight during the school day was at lunch. There were two lunch shifts, and every day I sat with the other black students who shared my lunch period. The usual crew included Jeff, Thelma, Ernie, and Elizabeth, but that sometimes varied. We always sat in the same spot though, at the second table on the far right. I chose a seat with my back to the rear of the cafeteria, which allowed me to face the greater part 
of the dining room in the doorway to the hall, I always brought my lunch from home too so that I could avoid the cafeteria line. None of the white kids ever invited me to join them at their tables. And the truth be told, I never even thought much about it. I looked forward to seeing my friends. It was the only time of the school day that I felt at ease enough to laugh. By the end of each school day, all nine of us were exhausted. When we climbed into the car to head to the bases home together, it was the first time of the day that all nine of us were together again, and we were happy to see one another. Some of the other shared stories about what happened to them that day and being teenagers, we usually found a way to laugh about it. I laughed with my comrades, but I rarely chimed in on the, the storytelling. I just didn't want to relive any of it. Every ounce of energy I had left, I needed for homework. Sometimes when one of us had experienced a particularly tough day, the car would fall silent. We noticed a pair of worry eyes and we knew. Every one of us just knew. Once we arrived at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Bates, we'd file in through the carpet, the carport door. Hardly anyone ever used the front entrance and grabbed a snack from the stash she kept for us in the kitchen. Chips, cookies, cold drinks. We'd often find Mr. Bates there stretched out in his lounge chair in a small adjacent family room in the front of the television. He had a calming presence that seemed to add a bit of levity to our days. The nine of us usually headed down to the basement for a casual debriefing with Mrs. Bates. Each of us found a comfortable spot on the sofa, a chair, or the floor to answer Mrs. Bates' questions. Questions. She would ask each of us about our day, who did what, when, where, whether we reported the trouble, whether anyone witnessed it, and who, if anyone, responded. At first, I dutifully told her all that had I had experienced, but day after day, nothing seemed to change. I know she would have fixed it if she could have, but it seemed to me that she was about as helpless to fix things as we were, so I stopped sharing for some I stopped sharing. For some, those sessions may have been uh, cathartic. For me, it was wasted breath, wasted energy, having to go through the trauma all over again. When my turn to share rolled around, I just say, my day was all right, or things went okay at home. I respond the same way when my parents or younger sisters asked about my day. I just didn't want to worry them any more than I already had. I'm going to pause here for one moment and I'll pick back up with part two of chapter six.